scripture reading from, that isn't the scripture we're going to start with, but that is the basic thrust of uh, the message, which is uh, Jude one twenty one. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And, you know, sometimes we, as Christians, just think that uh, you say a prayer, you become a Christian, and then all things continue as they did before. And unfortunately, that's where a lot of us are, or have been. And um, so we want to go back a little bit in the teachings of Jesus to Luke chapter 8, starting at verse 5, and it's the parable of the sower. And it says, A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. Now, when we go through the sowing of the seed, remember that um, the passage refers to the type of soil the seed is sown into, or the circumstances the seed is sown into, but that would leave us with the impression that, that this, the, if we are the soil, then there's not much we can do, because we are what we are, and that's the way it is. And that's not what Jesus is trying to teach us from that. What Jesus is trying to teach us is using his understanding and their understanding of what it meant to sow and see things grow, to understand the dangers and the challenges that we have if we're going to truly go from hearing the word to being fruitful with the word in our life. And that's why he's giving the teaching. Otherwise, it would be, why would you teach it if there was nothing that you could learn from it or there was nothing you could change? And so he sows his seed, and as he sowed, some falls by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowl of the air devoured it. And some of it fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked any moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it, and other fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit a hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. So the exhortation to uh, the phone, well, right? Uh, the exhortation to them is, Are you listening to what I'm saying? And and the thing is, God's talking to us on an ongoing basis, but are we hearing what He has to say to us? And I don't just mean with our ears hearing words. We we hear all kinds of things, but are we pondering the things that we hear from him enough for them to begin to challenge us and to shape us? And his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? And he said unto he said unto them, Unto you is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. So it's one of those things that's sort of a a cloaked, semi-cloaked message that's a parable that uh, on the surface wasn't necessarily easy to understand, but was for the people who are really listening to God, it was supposed to be uh, secrets of the kingdom. So these are basically secrets of the kingdom. And that's what he's talking about. He said, uh, unto you to hear and to understand the secrets or mysteries of the kingdom of God. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Okay, so the seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear, and then cometh the devil, and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. They on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation they fall away. And that which fell among thorns are they which, when they have heard, Go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth much fruit. So what is he saying to us? What is he saying to us? I mean, there's some pretty obvious things he's saying to us in there. But when he talks about the first group, the seed that falls on the ground and it gets trodden underfoot. You know, that's a whole, there's a whole bunch in there. The first thing is it's seed that fell on a hard place. And the hard ground is hard to bear fruit in. The second thing is it's trodden underfoot. In other words, it's treated casually or disrespectfully. It's kind of like the salt on the driveway you put down to, to uh, get rid of the ice and snow, but it's not something that you, you worry about. So you don't worry about getting on your shoes, you just kick it out of the way and you move on with your life. And that's sort of, what it, the implication of it is that God is speaking. The seed is going forth, and if we're listening, we will no longer be the, the hard ground, but we will move on at least into the next phase of the growth process, right? The 
word that we heard did not profit them as it profited us, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So it's not that the people don't hear the word. I mean, people always say to me, well, we need to really do a lot more evangelism. And I said, well, yes, we do, as we are led by God. Because as you're going to see in the passage, it's all about being people being ready to receive something. Otherwise, it does more harm sometimes than good, if you understand what I'm saying to you. How often have you heard people say to you, yeah, yeah, I know some Christian people and they, you know, whatever, you know, their experience is not a positive experience. It's, it's that it's a negative experience. And that doesn't mean um, that it's the person's fault. It just means that that person has not been ready either to hear or to understand any of the things that were presented to them. If you read in Romans 10, it says that the Spirit of God has gone out into all the earth. And so we know, even historically we know, that there have been people who walked out of a, an area of lack of civilization where there are no witnesses, no testimonies, no churches, and have come out believing in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior because the Spirit of God has spoken to them. So it's not that God has left us here alone, that if you don't speak to them, nobody's going to hear. No, we're supposed to be partners together with God in the work of ministry so that we're in tune with Him. So as we're sitting on the bus... We're, we're careful about the seed that we sow so that it isn't trampled underfoot, but instead we, that's why it says, let your conversation always be with salt seasoned with grace. Or with grace seasoned with salt, sorry, the other way around. Right? That your conversation should, should always be gracious in every situation. We should always exude the grace of God. That is, that is the DNA that God is creating in us. You know, we sing those songs, I am a new creation. <coughs> Then we go out and we live like we're the old creation. Right? I am a new creation. And so every day as we get up, every day is a new day. And every day as we get up, we need to be saying, today, God, I, I continue to want to walk in your presence. And so you're going to see in this is, is, is part of that process. Jesus said in John 10 and 9, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. But the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. That's what we're offering people. We're not offering them condemnation. We're not offering them guilt. We're not offering them. That doesn't mean they don't have to repent. If we remember, we talked briefly about the principal doctrines of Christ. And what is the first one? Repentance from dead works. It comes before faith towards God. You know, and, and so there's a sense where the conviction of God and the Holy Spirit comes to convict people of sin. And as they're exposed to the Holy Spirit, He creates within them a desire to change because they they feel guilty for the stuff that they've done. They feel guilty for their lost situation. And so they cry out. Thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy and come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And it's interesting that he, when he's, Jesus is sharing the parable, the first thing he says is, those by the wayside are they that hear and the devil comes. So for those of you who don't believe in the devil, <laughs> Jesus believed in the devil, so whatever. Yeah. The <laughs> devil comes and takes away the word of their hearts lest they should believe and be saved. Should we stop preaching in case we don't know? No, we should always be, our conversation should always be centered on what we believe. Should always be centered on um, the priorities in our life. It's just, sometimes we just need to be sensitive to who we're speaking to. What they're ready to understand and hear. Then he goes on and he says, They on the rock are they which, when they hear the word, they receive the word with joy, and they have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. And you've all had that experience. You've maybe gone out to some place, and were praying with someone, and loving the Lord, and they were excited about their new experience and everything, and then a week later, you talk to them, and oh, I don't want to talk about that. I'm not interested in that. I've, I've moved on, kind of thing, you know. And the whole thing about this is, God is looking to create disciples, okay? Go ye into all the world and make disciples of all men. It's not about getting people to say a prayer and checking them off your little list. They've said a prayer, I got, they're off my list. It's, that's the beginning of it. You know, oftentimes people will come to me and say, now, Pastor Tim, I brought uh, some friends of mine to church, so now they're your responsibility. <laughs> 
And it's like, uh, I'm sorry. Um, when, when someone gives birth to a baby, they don't go to their neighbor and say, okay, I've done my part here, now you raise my child for me. <laughs> well, it's the same thing. Like, so, because part of the growth in you is only going to happen as you have to disciple other people. Hopefully you've come to understand that. That it's when you start to get uh, the late night phone calls from the person last week that you witnessed to, and now they've got challenges and struggles, and they call you at night, and you can't just hang up the phone and say, I don't know, I'm in middle of the night, I'm sleeping. Because they're, they're looking to you. You, you, are, you are the only connection they really have with God is because you are the one that introduced them. And now they want to take the next step. They, they want to begin to solidify. They want to begin to put down roots. And so they call you and they, they have questions. They have issues. They have stuff that comes up and, and they're looking to you to be a source of, you don't have to have all the answers. You just have to point them in the direction to the answers. You have to say, you know what? That's a good question. Why don't you and I pray about it? We'll get together during the week and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it some more. And you pray with them and you and you speak God's peace over their life and, and you speak God's revelation over their life. You maybe don't know the answer. That's okay. Nobody knows all the answers. But you're their spiritual parent. So you wouldn't leave a newborn baby out on King and James and just say, there you go, baby. Have a good... <laughs> you know, you're, you're alive now. You have our new creation in Christ. No, and so you, you have to be the nurturer. You have to be... Some are better at that than others. I understand that. And then you plug them in with a group of, of God-fearing people who can come alongside of them and answer questions and then nurture them. Mark 4, 21, And he said unto them, Is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed and not to be set on a candlestick? For there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested, neither was anything kept secret, but it should come abroad. If um, any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And he said unto them, Take heed what you hear, with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you. And not to you that hear shall more be given. For he that hath to him shall be given, and to him that hath not from him shall be taken away even that little that he hath. And he said, So is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed into the ground, and should, should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring forth and grow up, you know it not how, for the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, and after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth immediately, he put it in the sickle, because the harvest has come. And he said, Whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God, or with what shall comparison shall we compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when it is sown in the earth is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. And when it is sown, it groweth up and becometh greater than all the herbs, and shooteth out great branches so that the fowl of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. So he's talking about that growth process. He's talking about the seed that is sown, and, and as it's nurtured and it grows, there's a harvest. And that, I mean, the whole passage is about the harvest because after the seed is sown, if, it, if it's sown in the good ground, it brings forth fruit. Well, what is the fruit? Well, you, there's a whole bunch of things. We, you know, we could do a whole thing on fruit. Right. The fruit of the spirit. The fruit of the spirit. Some of them. That's right. The fruit of the spirit is some of them. What else is there? The, you are the fruit. <laughs> Newborn Christians are the fruit of being Christians. If the Bible tells them all through the Bible. We have in the beginning. He said, you know, the animals are going to bring forth after their kind. And so when you're born again as a Christian, the fruit, part of the fruit you're going to bear is bringing forth after your kind. It's not a, a, a special dispensation to be called to bring forth fruit. That's, that's the natural consequence of living in, remember we talked about that, in living in a relationship with God is the same as a husband and wife living in a relationship. Right? If you're in an intimate relationship with someone of the opposite sex, what's going to happen? Fruit, unless one of three things happens. One, there's a physical disability that prevents it. There's a deliberate will that works against it. Or you're not living in intimacy at all. And that's not a statement of condemnation or anything. That's just a statement of fact. So if a man and woman are living together in an intimate relationship, they're going to have children. Unless they deliberately choose not to have children. One or both of them is physically unable to have the children. 
or they're lying to us and they're not really living in an intimate relationship, but they're living in a relationship that's like a brother and sister relationship. That's a different relationship. It's the same in our relationship with God. If we're having an intimate relationship with God, we're going to bear fruit, unless there's something wrong with us, which we need to be dealt with. Two, we don't want to bring forth fruit, so we're not participating in that. Or three, we just are not really intimate with God at all. That's just the way it is. So we can use the vine, vine your branches. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's right. So we move on in the story, right? And so the next part of that is, and they that fell among thorns are they which when they had heard go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring forth no fruit to perfection. So the Bible talks to us a lot about that. It says, you know, uh, even our passage here about keeping ourselves in the love of God. You know, there's a lot of uh, ideas. There's a lot of things competing with God in your life. Right? God is in your life. To what degree is God in your life? Is God a big part of your life? Is God a little part of your life? Jude 120 says, But you, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourself in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, and of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. And so the cares of this world, right? The cares of this world. Proverbs 4.20 says, My son, attend unto my words, and incline thine ears unto my saying. Let them not depart from thine eyes, keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee a froward mouth, and a perverse lips put far from thee. Let thine eyes look right on, and let thy eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet, and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. And so he, the instruction about it is there's, there is a, an active involvement in our life. You know, uh, people always say it's a free gift. Salvation is a free gift. How many people believe salvation is a free gift? We receive it by faith. It's free. Not of works with any mention boast. But to keep ourselves in a situation where the things of this world or the lack of root development or a doubting heart to keep ourselves from those things there's things we must need to do you know you the the you, the ground has to be cultivated the weeds have to be pulled you might say well I don't need that to be saved no you don't but you run the risk of having the life of Christ in you be choked out by the word by the weeds how many people do any gardening <coughs> don't do any gardening at all have any plants well I'll tell you you plant things in your garden and plants grow slow and take a lot of work. Weeds need no help. Right? So just from a practical standpoint, if you're going to live the Christian life, the, the fruit of God in you grows in, in, in tribulation. It grows in prayer. It grows in active effort of us participating to walk with God. And that's the thing. God requires of us, once we come to know Him, to effort to walk with Him. That's what the Bible says. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon his name while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts and return to the Lord and he will abundantly pardon you. There's a whole bunch of stuff in there. I mean, there, there's a sermon there in that one passage. <clears throat> it's not like I said a prayer and now I don't have to worry about anything because the thought of the air are coming to steal the word. Even today as we sit in the service, you know, I remember as a, as a young person sitting in the Baptist church and as the preacher's preaching, and I know that I wanted to listen to what he was saying, but, you know, uh, thoughts of uh, swimming at the beach or going to the Bahamas or uh, going out on my friend's mini bike or something, those thoughts come in, and, and the things that were of God, they were there, but the bottle of the air come to pluck them away. 
you have to make a conscious effort to choose. What does he say here? Um, it's about the effort we have to make. Choose what you hear. Are you, are you, the, the devil's blasting his sound as loud as he can blast it. That's what's playing. Top 500 hits in Canada. The devil! Tune in. It doesn't matter what channel you tune in, it's all the same. They word it differently. They present it differently, you know? But you have to listen for the still small voice of God. That voice that comes to you when you seek him in the night. It begins to calm your heart and your fears and your troubles. I am with you. It's, it's replaying in your mind the promises of God. Reminding yourself. This is what God said. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. And take heed to yourself, let us, and lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so the day comes upon you unaware. Now we started the service, we, we were talking about how God wants to prepare us for the days that lie ahead. How often I've sat in a, a meeting and I had listened to someone sit down at the piano and play these great worship songs. Just, just they flow from them as they play. And how often I've said to myself, oh, I'd love to play like that. In fact, I, I went to the doctor once and I said, doctor, I hurt my hand, but if you it's healed, will I be able to play the piano? And he said, sure, you should be. I said, well, I couldn't play before, so that's good news. Um, you know, um, and, I, and I have said it to the doctor kind of joking, but there's no shortcut to that. I can pray for it, I can wish for it, I can, I can do everything, but until I sit down and work at it, I'll never be able to play the piano like that. Now some people are more gifted than others, but the reality is that unless, unless I'm Beethoven, who sat down at the piano, I think when he was five, having gone to church that day, and he called it the box that was in their house, and he said after he got home from church, he sat down at the box and he played note for note perfectly what he had heard at church that day. But we aren't all that. And so my point in that is saying that there's lots of things we desire. If you desire God, then there's things that you need to desire to do to make it happen. God is faithful. But you need to have the intimacy with God be something that you walk in. And take heed to yourself, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life. And so the day come upon you unawares, for as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. See, that's, that's where the earth is. We have a, a, a world of people that are deluded. Because on one level or another, they've embraced things <coughs> that are not the truth. It's only the truth that can set you free. And you shall know the truth. The truth shall make you free. You can quest for whatever else you want, but it's only in the truth. And people say, well, I have my truth and you have your truth. No, no, there isn't my truth and your truth. There is only the truth. The rest is your opinion or your thoughts. There is only the truth. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. That's all there is. No man comes to the Father except by me. You can, you know, do your hokey pokey, whatever you want. But watch you therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Isn't that our goal? That that day we will, great day when we're there, we'll stand before him and give him praise. Proverbs 13, 4 says, The soul of the slugger desireth and hath nothing. I want, and I want you to think about that, because if, if you find yourself in that situation that I desire lots of things, but I don't have those things. I want you to think about it, because it says, The soul of the slugger desireth and hath nothing. You can desire whatever you want. We live in a world where they tell you that, um, you know, that 
You can buy a lottery ticket, maybe you'll be rich. And then you can buy all the things you want. And so people flock by the thousands, by the millions down there and they buy lottery tickets. And I'm not telling you not to buy a lottery ticket. That's between you and God. That's not none of my business. But, but how easy it is to sell that. Did you know that in Las Vegas, that the lottery, Lotto Canada and Lotterio would be ruled illegal? Do you know why they'd be ruled illegal? Because it would be called an unfair game of chance. In other words, the odds of you winning are so low that it would be considered a crime. Isn't that weird? But here, it's like, it's the thing, man. Let's go buy a ticket. It's an unfair game of chance. And the government makes money, and goes into the whatever, and, and you spend money. The soul of the slugger desireth and have nothing. I, you know what, as a child, how many things did you ever desire as a kid? I'd love to do, the, oh, this wouldn't be great, you know? Desiring stuff isn't going to help you. And then it goes on and it says, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. The soul of the diligent, and the soul meaning our mind, our will, our, our, our development. We will be fat in our development as a person. Diligent. We need to be diligent in the things of God. If you want to be in that, you know, it, it was always great in the story when they, the children of Israel have left Egypt and they're in the wilderness and it would say about, and Moses would come into the, the tabernacle, the tent they'd set up to worship God. And he would meet with God there and then he would go and it would say, but Joshua lingered on. Joshua, although he wasn't Moses, he desired the presence of God in his life. And of course, we know that after Moses dies, Joshua becomes the leader of the children of Israel. If you desire the things of God, and you're diligent in your pursuit of God, you will be fat in your walk with God. So, The sower sows the word of God. Everybody hears it. That's the reality of it. The first group of people, they hear it, but they discard it. It gets trodden underfoot. Follow the air, come and they eat it. You know, I was thinking about a little story about two birds that went for a walk in the woods. And as they're going, the first bird, first bird has this package of seeds that he's throwing down the ground behind him. And as they're walking along, they get out in the woods, and the second bird says to the first bird, he says, you know, how do we know we won't get lost? And the first bird says, well, that's why I've been sowing the seed behind us, so we got a trail to follow. The second bird goes, oh, I thought that was food, I've been eating it. <laughs> now, there's a couple morals in that story. The Bible says, uh, to communicate, forget not. That's one of the first rules. Communication's a good thing. The second thing is, obviously, what are two birds doing walking in the woods? <laughs> God gave them wings to fly. They don't need to follow a seed trail. They can just fly above the trees and find out where they are. Right? But the point I'm trying to make in that is that we need to begin to understand what the important things in life are. You probably have a friend like that bird following you on down your trail, life trail. Hopefully you're communicating with them the things of wisdom and truth. It doesn't mean you can't go fishing. It doesn't mean you can't go have a coffee together. It doesn't mean you can't watch a movie or some sporting event. But it does mean that in all that, God has created an opportunity for you to invest in the people around about you. That's your responsibility. That's why for such a generation as this, you, you, you meet people every day. What is your investment? You know, I, um, my car was in for servicing, and uh, it's in Dundas, but I was coming here, so I took the bus. Like you're supposed to do, like I took the bus. So I caught, got on the bus in Dundas and I came and got off up here. And you know, the amazing thing about it was that absolutely nobody talked to each other on the bus. The bus driver didn't talk to anybody. Passengers didn't talk to anybody. Everybody either had headphones on, cell phone in front of them, some book or something they were reading. Nobody talked to each other. I thought this is the most bizarre thing. Like you, you, you have an audience of people, you have an opportunity, but 
our enemy has worked very hard at making sure all the opportunities get taken away from us. Anybody you're in close contact with, he doesn't want you to talk to. You go to the coffee shop. Unless people know each other, they don't talk to each other. I thought, you know, all the years I drove bus, and I remember I would start the late shift because I was the last king bus, and I would start at 7.45 at night was when I started. And I got on the bus, and because uh, I didn't finish till 3 something in the morning. And, um, and I would say to God and to myself, I'm going to talk to every single person that gets on this bus. That was a busy bus. Mm -hmm. And I said something to every single person that got on the bus. Mm -hmm. I said, that's the minimum. I, I mean, as a, this is my job, but I, I mean, I, I'm not here to witness to people. They're not paying me for that. They're paying me to drive the bus. But they are encouraging me to talk and be friendly with the customers. So it's good customer service. And so I would talk to every single person that got on the bus. Some of them were receptive and open. Some of them were mad. Oh, the machine talks. You know. Um, but it didn't matter because it was just, you, hey, how are you? Hey, good to see you, whatever. And then in that would open up opportunities of conversation and communication. And you'd begin to... Um, um, sense where people were and you begin to have open up or they would say you know um, hey I know that you have a I remember them saying I know you have a break at such and such a time how about I order a pizza at such and such a place and I'll we'll pick it up on our way by and then we'll sit at Eastgate Square and we'll eat the pizza because you got 45 minutes there or half an hour there and so oftentimes there would be five or six of us on the bus eating pizza together because that's what we would do and you would meet people and you would be involved in their life and they would ask you to pray for them because they'd find out who, what you believed and what you were all about. And so wherever we are, we don't have to be hammering people with the gospel. In fact, that's the worst thing to do. What we're supposed to do is, is have compassion. Care about people's lives. And if you care about people's lives, they'll want to know why you care about their life. And then we have an opportunity to let the light of Christ shine. And Jesus said this to his disciples. He said, these things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. You know, God wants you to live in peace. That doesn't mean there's no fighting. That's not going to ever happen. This world is full of turmoil and anxiety and stress and everything. But in that, we might have the peace of God reigning in our life. Now, I'm not asking you to go out from here and be a perfect person. I'm asking for you to go out from here and be involved in the things that matter. We know that this world is headed for a very difficult time. Does that mean we should just let it? No, we should still speak up. You should vote. You should pray about voting. Who should I vote for? You should pray about being involved in the processes. You know, they send notices by that there's something happening in your neighborhood. Go to the meeting if you have the time or and feel prompted of God to go and share an input that might be helpful in a positive direction. Don't just rant. Don't just go to sleep. Keep yourself in the love of God. That God might use this as a positive influence in our world and in the lives of individuals. And Jesus said, these things have I spoken unto you that you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Let's pray. Father God, our desire is that as we would go from here, we would live a fruitful life. We're not perfect. You know that. You know our ins and outs, all our thoughts and everything that happens in our life. You know that's that's a great thing to know that we can come before you and you already know it all, so there's no point trying to pretend. But God, our desire is that we would take some of these things that your scriptures talk about and we'd apply them in our life that we might grow from that person who barely hears and understands to that person who begins to live that fruitful life that brings forth fruit both in the spiritual realm and in the uh, followers realm. That there might be disciples birthed out of our life, out of our testimony, by your spirit. And so God, as we go out into this world to live, we say, God, here we go. Unless our life ends, unless you come back, we go out into the world knowing that you're with us. And we ask that you lead us in that, that we 
wouldn't be looking to make ourselves a spectacle, but we would be looking for an opportunity to invest in people's life those words, those gracious words that are seed sown, that open up opportunities for change and for growth, that the truth of Jesus Christ may be manifest in and through us in this world. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for the message, Pastor. You're more than welcome, my friend.